we're going to talk a bit about sort of the difference between American and, and UK media, the sort of balance between alternative media and mainstream media. I thought I'd just sort of uh, introduce myself a little bit and then ask you to introduce yourself in case there's people on our channel who aren't familiar with you. So my, my background, I, I worked for Channel 4 News for many years in the UK and then the BBC and then made documentaries for several years. So I've worked in a newsroom in the, the mainstream media, sort of the, what you probably call the, the liberal mainstream media. And also for the last year and a half or so, I've been, I've been sort of delving more deeply into YouTube after setting up Rebel Wisdom, the, the, the YouTube channel. So I kind of had a bit of a steep learning curve in terms of seeing the difference between the two, but it's been a really interesting journey and in sort of producing documentaries and films on, on YouTube. Um, can you tell me a bit about your background and, and what you've, maybe a little bit of what you've learned doing it over the last however many years? Sure. So now I host the David Pakman Show, which is a multi-platform, independent, progressive show uh, based in the U.S., uh, multi-platform, meaning that the program is on radio stations, it's on television stations, it's on satellite TV, uh, on a channel called Free Speech TV. And then independently, we also have a, an online presence with a YouTube channel and an audio podcast. And in, in terms of how it's changed, I mean, of course, on, an, on the technical side, it's changed. And I hope for, for the better, as uh, you know, my production team has expanded and gotten more, more tech savvy. And technology has continued to improve and become more accessible. But I think from from a sort of uh, perspective um, uh, point of view, uh, at the beginning, I would tend to do much more of the on the one hand, on the other hand, sort of presentations. And I realized that that was both not particularly interesting to me, that I really wanted to be giving my opinion, my point of view. And it also wasn't super interesting to the audience because uh, it was, you know, either way, there are going to be people who disagree and I might as well just do the best job I can of advocating for what I sort of think is best or the best policy. So I think over time, the program has certainly become more, more opinionated than it started as. I'd love to return to that, um, a bit later on because there, there is this sense that this, this kind of view from nowhere affectation that the mainstream media has has been shown up quite a lot by the growth of alternative media as being as being an affectation like there, there is no view from nowhere and I think that's becoming really much more clear one of the reasons that I was really keen to talk to you David was I I, I, I wasn't I confess I wasn't that aware of your show until I started diving into my preparation for my interview with Dave Rubin and I I, I saw that I think one of the th things in the online media space at the moment is it's very easy to get caught in reality tunnels. It's very easy to end up giving your audience what you want. And I could see that at times you'd taken unpopular, unpopular perspectives with your audience and that you seemed willing to engage with people from all over the political spectrum, but from, a, from what I could see from a, a very good faith perspective and being willing to, to say things that might make you unpopular. Is that is that have that? Could you tell me about some of those occasions that have um, that have happened on your channel, and why has that happened? Do you think? Well, I mean, I think certainly everything I say is unpopular with someone. I think maybe what you're getting at is uh, sometimes there have been stories where there was more of a backlash from what I guess I would perceive to be maybe my core progressive audience. You know, to uh, generally well to the left of someone like Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden, but still probably to the right of actual socialists and communists, so to speak. So some somewhere in there in, in the sort of so world of social democracy. Um, and, you know, my principle has been I mean, going back to the first thing we talked about in, in kind of explaining to you the philosophy of my show and how I've gotten away from this idea of uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, the view from nowhere and just really doing every story the way I see it. I recognize that you're never going to see eye to eye on every issue with any particular person. I mean, with people that I consider to be my strongest political allies, there there still can be areas of disagreement and there, there almost always are. So the approach that I've taken to just do every story the way I see it, regardless of the consequences, is based in I just want to be genuine. Right. And if I start 
um, moderating. And by moderating, I don't mean moving to the middle, but I mean being a moderator of my own speech on the basis of what I think the audience reaction will be. It's it's actually a, potentially a slippery slope I don't want to get into. And I'm always cautious of slippery slopes when I don't think they apply. But that actually could be a slippery slope I don't want to get into. So, for example, there was a recent uh, story in the United States about a congresswoman named Ilan Omar where she made uh, some comments related to uh, the Israel lobby. And there were a number of perspectives on what she said, ranging from it was downright evidence of her personal anti-Semitism all the way to the other side of it was a perfect analysis that was in no way tinged with anti-Semitism. And I took what I knew would be a position that some in my audience would uh, disagree with or, or take issue with. Um, but I decided to take it anyway. You know, if I looked at my YouTube analytics, I probably had a net loss of subscribers as a result of doing that story. And that's OK. Uh, and I think that my my perception is that most of the audience that is supporting me financially is supporting me not because they expect that they're going to agree with me on every issue, but because they can trust that I'm going to be genuine with them about every issue and not calculate my perspective on the basis of what I think will be appealing to the people that are watching me, if that makes sense. We're in a media environment that really doesn't reward nuance, it seems. Absolutely. And on all of these issues, um, very often, the most controversial issues where maybe my audience and I have clashed, my core audience, as I as I would call them, are issues where if you ignore the nuance that I'm at least attempting to present uh, and sort of make a caricature of my position, you really are, are completely missing the point that I'm making. So another example would be Venezuela. Venezuela has been one. Uh, that I'm particularly interested in as an immigrant from Argentina to the United States and someone who who sort of grew up in a house where Latin American, South American politics were a topic of significant discussion. I have made every attempt to sort of make very clear whenever Venezuela comes up uh, and the Maduro Chavez um, uh, regimes come up to make very clear that I'm against American intervention in Venezuela. I'm against you know, military involvement by the United States and Venezuela, um, that historically American involvement in that region of the world has been disastrous for for the region, for the people of the region. Uh, but that as a non authoritarian leftist, I am not a supporter of Chavez. I was not a supporter of Chavez. I am not a supporter of Maduro. And unfortunately, the reaction from uh, many of uh, those in my core audience is, David, how dare you support the United States putting a puppet president in Venezuela, which, of course, is not an argument that I'm making. So uh, and that's not even particularly nuanced, right? I mean, from my point of view, it's I don't like the regime and I don't think it should be the United States that gets involved in replacing it. it to me, it's it's barely nuanced. But unfortunately, in an environment that doesn't seem to take super kindly to the on the one hand, on the other hand sort of thing, I've definitely suffered as a result of taking those positions. I'm really interested in, in reflecting on a few recent pieces, a few recent uh, media encounters that showed up sort of some of the culture clash between alternative and mainstream and also UK and US, maybe starting with the sort of very high profile um, clash between Andrew Neil on the BBC and Ben Shapiro. Why don't you just say that you're on the left? Uh, is this so hard for you? Why can't you just be honest? <laughs> Mr. Seriously, Shapiro, I, it's a serious question. Mr. Shapiro, if you only knew how ridiculous that statement is, you wouldn't have said it. So let's move on. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, so is there a particular um, I mean, do, do you want to get my general sense of it, so to speak? Yeah. Why don't, why don't you why don't you sketch out what you made of it from there? I mean, how familiar with the UK? Because it seemed that Ben Shapiro in particular wasn't very familiar with UK journalistic styles, which is very combative, very sort of devil's advocate questioning. And he, he seemed to completely misunderstand and quite amusingly for a British person, British watcher, because Andrew Neil is famously right wing. Um, he accused Andrew Neil of being clearly a left wing interviewer. 
Yeah, I thought that there were you know, the, my analysis. I, I maybe am more familiar with that style than at least Ben Shapiro appeared to be during that particular interview, although my familiarity with with Andrew Neal was was limited, although I was generally aware of him as a uh, uh, as a conservative individual personally. So I wasn't so surprised by the interviewing style. My surprise was really um, maybe, as you're hinting at, at the way that Ben Shapiro handled it, who within the context of the United States and often in particular during uh, these events that he does at uh, colleges and universities where he's being questioned primarily by by college students effectively, there's this idea that he's never rattled and that his mind operates so quickly and that you can't uh, trick him in any way and that he's always one step ahead and ready with the sort of most powerful, brutal refutations, as many YouTube uh, clip titles like to, to point out. Um, so I was most surprised by the way that he was so thrown off by the way the interview was going. Um, and then it, it got very quickly to where, you know, two principles that Ben Shapiro espouses almost to uh, a, a level of satire in the United States are this idea of facts don't care about your feelings and also being very much against so-called identity politics as defined in, in a sort of very particular way. And where it kind of broke down was that Ben violated both of those ideas, right? His incorrect uh, perception of the identity of the interviewer uh, caused him to sort of cut it short on the basis that this progressive left wing, whatever term you want to apply to the interviewer, was not interviewing him in good faith or was uh, employing some kind of gotcha questions or however you, you want to analyze it. Um, one of his principles uh, in the context of how he's known in the U.S. is that identity is not relevant in situations like this, that it's all about what are the facts. And in a sense, his feelings sort of got the best of him. His feelings overrode the facts, which were the, the questions posed to him by the interviewer uh, and the reality that the interviewer was actually a conservative personally, not not on the left. So that was the, what was so interesting to me, that someone who is known in the U.S., as being sort of unshakably principled in uh, identity doesn't matter. It's all about the facts. It's all about reality. Um, abandoned that as uh, he was very rattled by the way that the interview was carried out. Yeah, I mean, this is a good time to to mention Dave Rubin. So I went, I, I interviewed Dave Rubin a bit over a month ago now and put the interview out probably two weeks ago, something like that. And I, I first found out about the intellectual dark web through Dave Rubin's show. And so I was sort of very, um, I, I guess I, I was, I admired a lot of the conversations that I'd seen on the show and I hadn't paid a huge close attention to the other interviews that he'd done. And then in the research for the interview that I did with Dave, I dug up quite a bit of stuff that made that, that gave me a few concerns and I knew that going in for my own sort of self-respect as a journalist, I had to ask some more probing questions. My, the criticisms that I've seen of you that I think have some, some validity is sometimes you draw this, you talk about a new center evolving, mm -hmm. but you draw that new center around some people that, that I would consider on the right, like Steph, Stefan Molyneux, for example. Well, I've never said that Stefan Molyneux is in the new center. I really? mean, have you ever heard me say that? I, thought you had. No, I've never no? said that. No. I checked again after the interview. One of the reasons I got in touch as well is that this has started happening more and more at Dave Rubin's events, that there are people who are asking him, why won't you talk to ContraPoints? Why won't you talk to Karl Kalinske? Why won't you talk to Sam Cedar? Why won't you talk to David Pakman? And I know recently as well that he, he said on stage that you'd lied about him or he gave a reason why he wasn't going to to, to be interviewed by you. Uh, or to interview me, I guess it was. Yeah, he said Pac-Man's lied about me. I think it was a bunch of times or many times or something like that. I still, you know, if that's the case, then I, I really want to know what, what those lies or, you know, I, I would argue that they wouldn't really be lies. They might be misstatements, which I very well might have made about uh, Dave Rubin. I just don't know what they are. I, I haven't heard so far. Um, I mean, listen, my my perspective is... Uh, so I'm not a journalist per se. Dave Rubin is not a journalist. We are doing programs that are uh, commentary, interview analysis, call it sort of what you want. So, you know, my 
primary criticism of the way that Dave Rubin has carried out uh, uh, interviews are, are sort of there's two criticisms. One is I think that left wing voices outside of the so-called intellectual dark web uh, have been mostly excluded. Now, I know that recently there were assertions made that Dave is interviewed. I don't know if he said it was socialists and communists or lefties and communists or something like that. That may be true. I don't I don't know who those folks are, and I'd be interested in, in knowing about that. But I think generally speaking, if what you don't have to give equal voice to all sides of the political spectrum, that's totally fine not to. Um, but I think that if you are sort of asserting that there is a sort of open door policy to all sorts of ideas, then I think it would be best to more equally represent ideas from a variety of of sort of placements on the political spectrum. So that's been one of my criticisms. And, you know, we I tentatively at one point was going to be appearing on on Dave's new program and then it didn't happen. And it's not uh, completely clear to me exactly why. And I think at this point I, I don't have the open invitation that at, that at one point I did. So I would be glad to be one of those people and I would be glad for others to to be those folks. You know, my particular interest in this is that I used to be relatively friendly with Dave and we used to text and have phone calls uh, with some sporadic uh, regularity, I guess it would be the term I would apply to it. And since I interviewed him on my program for an hour, we've had almost no communication. And there's been what I perceive to be sort of like a cutting of what was at one point a very cordial and friendly relationship. And I don't know why that is. I don't know. He's never expressed that he wasn't happy with how the interview with me went, where I did go into policy in the way that I like to health care, taxation, et cetera. So that's sort of my personal interest in it. Um, as far as the, the one other thing I'll say is as far as the interview style. Yes, I've been critical of giving a platform and that's the term I use and I don't use it pejoratively when you have a platform and you invite someone to it, you are sharing that platform with the other person. I take special care because of how I manage my show, where if I am platforming someone whose ideas I perceive to be extreme, dangerous, uh, discriminatory, problematic, I make sure that I'm responsibly platforming them, which includes both um, uh, being prepared to take on what I perceive to be bad arguments and not being afraid to make clear that I disagree with some of those arguments or positions. I would like to see Dave do that. And as I've told him personally, uh, he can kind of manage those interviews however he wants, but it's not how I would feel good about handling some of those interviews. Now, the reason maybe he doesn't uh, feel comfortable being that adversarial, that would be perfectly fine. The reason may be that he agrees with those things that maybe I see as problematic positions or some other reason. I don't know what the reason is, but it's not how I would sort of run my program. If uh, there are critiques out there of Dave Rubin or whoever, which are limited to this is a person who is doing something wrong because of the political orientation of their guests, period. That is guilt by association. And it's it's also just not really uh, a serious critique. Um, I think that my critique of the instances or the episodes of the Dave Rubin program uh, that I have made focus on number one, uh, do I believe that there is irresponsible platforming taking place with regard to if there are known bad or incorrect ideas or ideas that are discriminatory ideas that are xenophobic or whatever, um, is the interviewer well enough prepared to push back against those and whether or not, I mean, you could be prepared and still choose not to push back. I don't think that that is responsible platforming. I don't think that that serves uh, any serious journalistic or cultural purpose. Uh, most people who sort of exist in the West and have access to the Internet and to media know that xenophobia exists, that uh, white supremacy exists, that anti-Semitic conspiracies exist, so on and so forth. And I don't understand the value of merely giving someone a platform to espouse those ideas. Uh, so what I'm for is responsible platforming. I have interviewed all sorts of right wing people, people with really disgusting views. But the only way that I feel good about it, uh, about doing it, 
is if it's made abundantly clear that it's, I disagree with these uh, horrible ideas and I'm prepared to push back against them. So to the extent that Dave Rubin has done interviews, for example, with folks like Brigitte Gabriel, where she actually uh, touts anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and Dave doesn't push back against it. Um, that's what my crit critique is of. It's not of the fact that he interviewed someone who's a right winger. I completely agree. That's not really a good criticism. It's not a productive one. Um, and it's not going to, I mean, listen, we, the left should engage with the right, the right, if it wants to, should engage with the left. Uh, but it needs to be done in a responsible way. And that's my approach to it. Since the interview that I did with Dave Rubin, there have been quite a few pieces on various left leaning channels about him, not just off um, because of my interview, although Sam Cedar did pick it up and run something on my interview. And I get a sense of almost like a feeding frenzy around him at the moment. And is that something that you're picking up? I'm picking it up as well. I think it's gotten momentum. And I think that there has been um, sort of because of the you know, the, there's no better way to get something discussed on a bunch of YouTube channels uh, than to mention the names of the hosts of those YouTube channels. So some of these people that have shown up at Dave's events and said, hey, what about David Pakman or Sam Cedar or ContraPoints? That's a great way to uh, get that story onto those shows for better or worse. But I do think, you know, listen, it, what, what's going on with Dave Rubin is not uniquely bad. I think it's a combination of sort of a, um, uh, 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 an audience capture sort of dynamic combined with uh, a, a predisposition from many of these internet enclaves to really um, uh, uh, adhere to the type of content that um, sort of is de facto uh, produced on Dave's channel. And I think that there is a bit of a free feeding frenzy going on. And I'm sort of trying to be careful not to devolve into the ad hominems to restate that I think he and I could have a, so a really great conversation, which I maintain my openness to participate in and, and sort of leave it at that. I also want to sort of uh, uh, take it out a little bit to say, so he's obviously been been challenged quite a bit and there's there's quite a lot of critiques of Dave out there already. And it th this seems to be a feature of the polarized landscape as well. I know like Sam Cedar, for example, and I think Michael Brooks on Sam Cedar's show, there's quite a lot, and Anna, Anna, Anna Kasparian as well, there's quite a lot of critiques of Dave that in a way I can see that the audience of those shows wants people to, to beat up on Dave Rubin. So that becomes, so the tone of those critiques seems to become more and more combative. And then the chances for any kind of dialogue or the chances of Dave sort of being able to say, well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll welcome these people onto my show, then seems to, to deteriorate massively because of the tone of those critiques. Do you see what I mean? That, like that polarization seems to make good faith dialogue even more difficult. Absolutely. I mean, on the one hand, why are some of these voices not being uh, interviewed by Dave Rubin? But on the other hand, I completely see why he would not be inclined to bring voices on that are sort of levying uh, harsher and harsher criticisms against him in terms of their tone as it goes sort of like above and beyond the facts. So that's why I've, you know, I have a track record that is not something to brag about. It's just a reality of being able to have civil conversation with almost anybody. Now, sometimes when I say that people will write to me and say, David, it's no big accomplishment to be able to calmly talk to Nazis. Right. And it's not I'm not citing it as an accomplishment in that sense. I mention it in order to be able to say, although I have these differences with Dave Rubin or with whoever, with Ben Shapiro or name anybody. Um, if we decide, hey, we're going to sit down and really figure out where do we agree, where do we disagree, what are the lines of this sort of uh, di this debate, uh, assuming that it doesn't evolve into personal attacks against me, I'm going to have no problem carrying that out in a civil way where really the focus is going to be substance rather than attacks or, or tone or whatever. Um, so I've tried to make it clear that these are my disagreements with Dave Rubin. Uh, in terms of what he's putting out on online, but I would sort of relish the opportunity to respectfully figure out where is he coming from on these things? You know, the last conversation I had with him, as I mentioned, was this hour interview I did with him at this point. It might be two years ago or more. Um, so I completely understand why, as people become more sort of virulent in their critiques, why 
he would be disinclined to allow them uh, to participate on his program. That being said, I also am unsure why someone, for example, who is openly homophobic or anti-Semitic, which relates to, to two you know, identities that that Dave Rubin um, uh, is, is part of, why they would be. Uh, I, I see that I see platforming that without serious challenges, just as problematic as sort of keeping out broad swaths of the political spectrum. Yeah, the, there is something quite ironic, I, I find, in, in what's going on at the moment. And I'm bringing in sort of Ben Shapiro here as well in, in his criticisms of Andrew Neil. And that there is almost a mirror image of what they accuse the left or social justice warriors of, of doing, of tone policing, of no platforming, of pre-deciding that a conversation is not going to be constructive. And that, that feels very ironic, like that there is something very, that there is, there is something that's very similar about those two perspectives. Yeah, and I'd love to have the opportunity to really explore that in uh, in in some detail for sure. I mean, being against identity politics, but then making identity arguments or being against sort of limiting the scope of voices or the ideas that are heard, but then not sort of actively pursuing more diversity of voices in, in those ways. And, um, you know, I, I do think that um, in it, without inviting me on anyone's program, I think that there would be a very interesting conversation to have with whether it's Dave or whether it's Ben Shapiro or, or whoever uh, about what I perceive to be a contradiction as far as that goes. And I've made some video clips on my channel about those those apparent contradictions. And I think it would be a great conversation to have. And it would not be uh, a, a bad faith conversation. I mean, I genuinely am interested in if someone says identity politics is bad, how do they justify making identity arguments? You know, I feel as though my view on identity politics is relatively nuanced, which is using identity as a sort of cudgel to suppress voices and to say only those who check a certain box should be listened to or primarily should be the ones listened to. I'm against that. But it would also be ignorant to ignore the reality that one's identity relates to their experience in the world. Uh, and thus, there may be some special value or particular value in considering that when we are exploring what we should be doing as humans on this planet in terms of figuring out the problems that face us. Are you familiar with Jonathan Haidt's work? Very much so, yes. And I, I've interviewed him and read uh, recently read uh, the uh, the, is it the righteous mind? The coddling of the American mind is the most recent one. The righteous mind is about how good people are divided by politics. That's the one I read. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think his work is absolutely crucial to to understanding if if political belief is largely based on temperament, then we have to keep talking to each other and the separation into armed camps, which is what seems to be happening through the kind of W sense making WMD of social media seems to be one of the most existential threats that we're we're facing. Absolutely. And, and privately, I've been talking to a lot of people about what are some techniques that have actually been able to sort of open the door to these cross party lines conversations. And there you know, are some specific techniques that I've come across, which I think are, are useful, which I'm glad to talk about, but maybe are, are not really the scope of, of our conversation today. But I do believe that there are lots of ways that these conversations can happen. And I think it's undeniable that social media is not facilitating any of that. I'd certainly be interested if you were able to run through them fairly quickly. Yeah, I mean, just a couple of ideas and some of these I employ them on my program when I have adversarial callers. I mean, one thing is a great basis for a conversation between people who disagree is asking the other person to sort of read back to you or to explain to you what do they perceive your position to be? And maybe more importantly, why do they think you've arrived at that position? So, for example, healthcare debates can be extraordinarily divisive just to take an issue uh, uh, like that. I am on the left and I believe that some sort of single payer nationalized or otherwise universal system is the way forward, although I'm relatively agnostic about the specifics rather than just like diving into uh, a very heated conversation about that with someone who thinks the market system is best. If I ask them, listen, you know my position. Why do you think I, I have my position? How what 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 led me to arrive at my position? If they are good faith participants, which will be very quickly exposed by a question like that, 
uh, merely by reading back to me why they think I believe what I believe. They are going to be significantly predisposed to listen to my ideas because they are probably going to attribute good faith reasons to how I arrived at my conclusion. They might say, well, listen, you probably think it's the most efficient way to get the best care to, to the most number of people. If someone just says that, that is instantly changing the tone and the tenor of the conversation in a way that I think is very positive. I t tend to follow that up with given your position on this issue. What evidence, if I was able to present it to you, would would change your mind? And this is something I first heard from Peter Bogosian, the defeasibility test, although I've seen it from others as well. Just those two questions to set up a conversation about most political issues will significantly include the chances of it being productive and maybe of actually making some progress on these issues. It's interesting. So we as I said, we featured the intellectual dark web quite a lot. And there's some talk about what it is and whether there could be a kind of IDW protocol for good faith conversation. That that, and that I think could be part of it. I, I think steel manning is something that Eric Weinstein talks about, which is kind of what you're talking about in your, what, what you were just saying is, can you restate back to me my own argument in a way that I'll agree with? I, I think that there's definitely significant overlap in the ideas, yeah. From my perspective, sort of, I'm thinking about what is the the other side of the culture war dynamic that we're looking at. And I think it is something like appreciating that everyone has values that are important. And Jonathan Haidt's work, I think, is really perfect for this to show that there are five moral taste buds. Liberals are more sensitive to two of them. Conservatives are more sensitive to the others. And that also that there's a sense that any idea, any any set of values, when taken to an extreme, can become an ideology, and then you're, in some sense, you're divorced from an evolutionary conversation at that point. In that that you can't really engage with anyone else because you've fixated your values into an ideology. I think that's right. In in the uh, last year and a half or two years, one of the most valuable experiences I had when it comes to this is I actually went. Um, uh, to rural northern Indiana in the Midwest of the United States, which is real Trump country, it's church country and it's gun country. I mean, it's basically a place where you drive down these country roads and the only things you pass are gun ranges and churches. And uh, in spending some time there and in talking to people, uh, I understand why they voted for Trump. I understand how abortion becomes this voting issue for large swaths of the country. I understand how guns sort of take on the cultural significance that they do for many people in the United States. It didn't change my views, but it definitely changed my perspective on, oh, yeah, I, I actually understand how if this is the environment you grow up around, you end up with the political views that seem totally antithetical to my sort of northeastern United States cosmopolitan views. And it was an extraordinarily enlightening experience, particularly in making me think about what are the best and I still think that they're wrong on policy, but how can I better engage with them on those issues? Great, David, thank you very much for for making the time. My pleasure. I, it was so great to speak to you.